Disasters, be they natural or man-made, leave indelible marks on the many people and communities they affect. At the same time, through the fire and ash rise those willing to lay their very lives on the line to help others. In this compilation, we explore several tragic events, each with a villain of one kind or another, but also their heroes. We begin with the story of the Coconut Grove. If there was a place to be seen on a Saturday night in Boston in 1942, it was the Coconut Grove. Nightclubs did not officially operate in Boston, so the Grove skirted restrictions as a supper club. The business had been around since 1927, built in the narrow, cobbled Piedmont Street near the Park Square Theatre District. The original owners were two men, Mickey Alpert and Jacques Renard, band leaders who had connections to the local mafia, connections that led to the Grove gaining a reputation as a speakeasy during the Prohibition era. These allegations grew stronger in 1931 when ownership was passed to a local mob boss and bootlegger named Charlie Solomon. In 1933, Solomon was indicted for operating an illegal liquor smuggling ring. But before legal proceedings could begin, he was gunned down in a man's restroom. Ownership of the Grove then passed to his lawyer, Barnett, Barney Walansky. Despite being a step removed from the Mafia, it's said that Walansky would often boast about his gangland connections and the fact he had the ear of Mayor Morris J. Tobin. By this point, the Coconut Grove had evolved into a sprawling complex. On the main floor, a large dining room and ballroom greeted visitors. A bandstand gleamed with several bars flanking this main area. The dining room featured a retractable roof for use during the steamy Boston summer. Around a corner and down a stairway, the basement contained the Melody Lounge, a dimly lit bar that hosted piano players, comedy acts and other entertainment. In the basement were also the kitchen, freezers and storage areas. The interior of the Grove was designed to transport its guests to the South Pacific. Leatherette, rattan and bamboo disguised walls. Heavy draperies and dark blue satin canopies clung to the ceiling. Support columns were made to look like palm trees. Light fixtures were hidden within coconuts. All materials used to disguise the squat brick building as a tropical oasis were effective as decor but a nightmare for fire prevention. On Saturday, November 28, 1942, Boston College's football team was trounced in a home game upset by Holy Cross College. Following the 55-12 defeat at Fenway Park, the celebration party scheduled at the Grove was canceled. This was only a minor setback for the Grove, however, as it had no problem attracting patrons. Hollywood Western star Buck Jones was persuaded by his agent to have dinner at the Grove after attending the game with Boston Mayor Morris Tobin. Jones wasn't feeling well and had been hoping for a quiet night alone. Still, he reluctantly entered the revolving door on Piedmont Street and climbed the raised platform reserved for celebrity diners after the maitre d' announced him. In the dining room, Patrons were crowded around small tables awaiting the start of the 10 o'clock show. The Melody Lounge downstairs was full too, the wait staff rushing to serve more than 1,000 diners and revelers. Pianist Goody Goodell took to the Melody Lounge stage and began to play. As she did so, a young man at one of the tables decided he and his date would like a little more privacy, so unscrewed a bulb in a coconut light fixture above where they were seated. Moments later, a 16-year-old busboy named Stanley Tomaszewski, rushing to clear glasses in the lounge, was ordered by a bartender to fix the light, which was affixed to the top of an artificial palm tree. As he set about doing as he was told, the busboy lit a match to see what he was doing, tightened the bulb and stomped the matchstick beneath his foot before returning to work. Moments later, 
patrons noticed the flicker of flames and the fronds of the palm tree, which quickly began to take hold. Bartenders jumped into action, dousing the fire with water and seltzer bottles, but to no avail. In an effort to stop the fire from spreading to the fabric-covered ceiling, the tree was pulled over, but it was already too late. From that flaming corner in the basement, the closest public exit was atop a four-foot-wide set of stairs leading to the foyer on the first floor. Some patrons made a rush towards the stairs. Others sat dumbstruck as the fire climbed across the furniture, igniting a fireball that spewed flames and toxic gas that battled towards the stairway. After singeing the hair off the heads of the patrons fumbling in the stairwell, the fireball burst onto the main floor foyer area. Cries of fire, fire filled the air and panic ensued. Patrons flooded the revolving door, which became jammed with bodies. Observers on the street watched as those within were crushed by the weight of the crowd surging against the door. Inside the grove, the fire had spread to the dining room and raced through the adjacent caricature bar, down a corridor to the Broadway lounge and across the dance floor as the orchestra was beginning its show. Another factor aiding the fire spread was the fact that due to shortages of the refrigerant Freon, the air conditioning system was instead using highly flammable methyl chloride as a coolant. Many of those inside the grove were overcome with flames and smoke inhalation before they could even leave their seats. More scrambled toward the exit on a wave of terror, the fire moving faster than they could run. Sadly, for most, it was futile. There was nowhere to run to. In an effort to stop people leaving without paying, Barney Wolanski had seen to it that all other exits were either concealed, locked, or even bricked up entirely. A plate glass window had also recently been boarded up, blocking that from becoming a potential escape route. In the Broadway lounge, an exit door was unlocked, but only opened inwards, useless against the crush of people clawing at it to escape. Employees who knew where the hidden staff only exits were shouted for guests to follow them down corridors to their escapes. In desperation, some patrons even hid in the freezers. The Boston Fire Department was nearby, extinguishing an automobile fire on Stewart Street at 10.15 when they noticed smoke coming from the club three blocks away. They moved to investigate and were met by frantic bystanders running towards them to report the incident. They found smoke pouring from every opening, with a slow stream of patrons escaping from what few exits they could find. By this point, many people from surrounding night spots had arrived on the scene and were attempting to help any way they could, many of them being soldiers and sailors. By 11.02, the fire chief had issued five alarms. The blaze was extinguished quickly, but it was still too late for hundreds. Stacks of bodies, some living and some dead, were piled shoulder high at the exits. Inside, the charred remains of diners were strewn everywhere. Those that had managed to get outside were now met by freezing November temperatures. After going from one extreme to another, once they took a breath of cold air, they were said to have dropped like stones. Inside the building, firefighters found the severely burned body of Buck Jones under his table. They also discovered the bodies of several patrons still sat at their tables with drinks in hand. So fast were the fumes and the flames. At the time of the Coconut Grove fire, owner Wolanski was recovering from a heart attack he had suffered 12 days earlier in a bed at Massachusetts General Hospital. Downstairs, over a hundred victims from the fire that had ravaged his club poured into the lobby. Another 300 were taken to Boston City Hospital. A temporary morgue was set up in a garage near the grove and staff and volunteers began the arduous process of attempting to identify bodies. Occasionally, they stumbled across one still breathing and rushed them to the hospital. 
the massive need for medical treatment forced personnel to adopt new care methods. Burns victims from the disaster were some of the first to be treated with penicillin to fight infections as part of their recovery. They coated skin in boric petroleum and stitched skin grafts. Experience from treating the coconut grove victims would also lead to the publication of the Lund and Browder chart, a tool used to estimate the total body surface area affected by burns, which is still used to this day. Sadly, many victims who appeared to escape the worst of it succumbed to pulmonary edema caused by breathing toxic smoke and gases from the burned furnishings. Others would spend years in hospital, but thankfully, all medical bills were waived thanks to donations by the Red Cross. By the time the figurative and literal smoke had settled about the grove, 492 people were dead, with another 166 injured. In the horrific aftermath, investigations were launched, resulting in a grand jury indictment of 10 people. In the end, though, only Wolanski was convicted on 19 counts of manslaughter. He was sentenced to 12 to 15 years in prison in 1943. Three years later, he was pardoned by Morris J. Tobin, who was now governor of Massachusetts. Nine weeks later, however, he succumbed to cancer. The building codes were amended in Boston and other cities. Revolving doors were outlawed for a time before being reinstated with the requisite they had to be flanked by two outward opening exit doors. Flammable decorations and inward swinging emergency exits were also banned as part of a raft of new safety laws. Today, a hotel now sits on the land where the coconut grove once was. The streets in the area have been altered and the location of the grove's revolving door now houses the intersection of Piedmont and Shawmut Street. A bronze plaque placed on the brick sidewalk nearby by the Bay Village Neighborhood Association in 1993 shows a diagram of the old club, the narrow corridors that ended in locked doors, the artificial palm trees that became pillars of flame. It reads, in memory of the more than 490 people who died as a result of the Coconut Grove fire on November 28, 1942. As a result of this terrible tragedy, major changes were made in the fire codes and improvements in the treatment of burn victims, not only in Boston, but across the nation. At the bottom of the plaque is the phrase, Phoenix out of the ashes. Before we leave, I'd like to share the story of a tragedy within the tragedy. One of the survivors that night was a man named Clifford Johnson. He had made it out of the burning building, but made his way back in several times in search of his date, who he had lost sight of. Unbeknownst to him, she had already made it out. The Coast Guardsman suffered over 55% burns to his body and spent over a year in hospital, becoming the most severely burned person to survive their wounds at that moment in time. He would go on to marry his nurse with the pair eventually moving to Missouri. There, Clifford got a job as a fuel delivery driver and tragically, on December the 20th, 1956, 14 years after surviving the Coconut Grove disaster, Johnson would perish when his vehicle crashed and burst into flame. We've covered many tragic events on the channel and one of the most saddening things we find is just how avoidable some of them are. One such avoidable event was the New London School disaster. March the 18th, 1937 was a sunny day in New London, Texas. Students and teachers alike were anxiously awaiting the final bell of the school day at the London School. It was a Thursday, but there were no classes the following day. Students were participating in an interscholastic meet, an academic and athletic competition in nearby Henderson. It didn't matter that they were at a brand new state-of-the-art school in one of the wealthiest school districts in the country. Afternoons before a long weekend are the same everywhere. 
50 mothers from the PTA were gathered to watch a dance program put on by the younger grades. Older students were finishing up their work and chatting excitedly about an upcoming sports game. Teachers were tucking belongings into purses, tidying their desks and half-heartedly shushing their pupils. In the school's basement, a beautifully equipped shop classroom gleamed with tools and had barely had a chance to be used. A shop teacher reached for a sander, flicking it on at 3.17 p.m., at which point the world seemed to end. Fifth grader Robert Hatfield hadn't wanted to go to school that day. He had asked to stay home, but his mother refused. Robert felt nervous all day for a reason he couldn't quite put his finger on. His skin was crawling and he just wanted to go. Just before the final period of the day, he asked the principal if he could go home instead of to study hall and was allowed on the condition of completing the work there. He started home walking the half mile to his house. As he drew close, his mother flew out of the front door. Robert braced himself for a scolding. As the pair drew within 10 feet of each other, an explosion ripped through the air. Mrs. Hatfield forgot her anger. In New London, motorists stopped their cars in the streets and climbed out. Shopkeepers walked away from their stores. Oil rig workers abandoned their duties. Everyone ran full tilt towards the school. New London was and is a small city in rural East Texas. It was an unlikely location for a million dollar school, but such were the spoils of oil. Despite the Great Depression, the taxable land value in 1937 had grown to $20 million, roughly $350 million today. And the district received additional revenue from 15 oil wells on their property. Impoverished families who had flooded the area found themselves sending their children to school, not to one of the one-room schoolhouses that were still common throughout much of the South, but to a sprawling 21-acre campus. The pristine site housed an elementary school, a gymnasium, and a floodlit football field, one of the nation's first. But the real star of the show was the two-story junior and senior high school, which served over 700 students in grades 5th through 11th. The modern E-shaped building featured a fully equipped chemistry lab, an auditorium, and an industrial arts workshop. In this school, 13 minutes before the last bell of the day, a spark from a sander resulted in an explosion that ripped through the building, lifting the roof clean off and sending brick, glass and wood flying as the walls collapsed. Survivors of the blast would later report hearing an enormous boom right before they were thrown through the air or covered by debris. One student recalls finding himself on the lawn outside. Another remembers a boy screaming, my legs been cut off through the haze of confusion. The metal lockers flew from the walls as they seemed to bulge outwards and then collapse. A student taking a nap in a car nearby to nurse a headache was awoken when a concrete boulder smashed through his car. In the moments following the explosion, teachers and students fought their way toward the exits. They jumped from windows and staggered down stairwells. They stepped over the bodies of their once frolicking classmates. They pulled on hands that emerged from under the rubble. Students who survived the event later described what they saw with one stating that they had seen a student lying dead with a popsicle still in their mouth. Another saw a man holding a little girl's lifeless body, her head a bloody pulp. Martha Harris thought they had been bombed by Hitler. She saw a child hanging from a window, caught on the glass and bleeding profusely. Barbara Moore remembered a deathly silence followed by screaming and moaning. Nathan Durham was reading Moby Dick in the library 
when a concrete girder smashed down on the table he was sitting at. Nathan had asked to change his last class of the day to general science, but had been turned down. Everyone in general science that day was killed, except for one who could never walk again. Within minutes, oil field workers and parents had flooded the scene, digging through rubble and searching for their children. By nightfall, 2,000 volunteers were tearing apart the site. School buses were pressed into operation to shuttle survivors home as ambulances rushed the injured and dying to local hospitals and clinics. Buildings in nearby towns were converted into makeshift first aid stations and morgues. Workers sorting through the wreckage often didn't even pause to see if the body they pulled free was still breathing. They simply moved it to the side and continued. Texas Governor James V. Allred dispatched the Texas Rangers, the Texas Highway Patrol and the Texas National Guard. 30 doctors, 100 nurses and 25 embalmers arrived from Dallas. Airmen from Barksdale Field, deputy sheriffs and even Boy Scouts rushed to the disaster site to lend a hand. 17 hours after the initial explosion, the entire area had been cleared. Parents identified the bodies of their dead children mainly through personal items and fingerprinting experts were brought in to identify victims who were so severely disfigured their faces were unrecognizable. It's estimated that 294 people died in the blast with more than 300 being injured. The investigation revealed that the school had been filling with natural gas before the explosion. To save money, the school board had cancelled its contract with Union Gas earlier that year, deciding to tap into a residual gas pipeline from the Parade Gas Line Company. The process of extracting oil often unearthed natural gas that was seen as a waste product by the oil companies. This would normally be burned off on site, but it was also common for it to be piped into properties and used much as we would use gas today. However, this untreated gas was of varying quality and most notably odorless. A faulty connection to this residual pipeline allowed the invisible and odorless gas to leak into the school, where it lurked undetected before a spark from a sander unleashed its destructive power. In an effort to find out how something like this could be allowed to happen, Parade Gasoline Company and the school district found themselves on the end of a lawsuit. However, a court ruled that neither could be held responsible. The school's superintendent, W.C. Shaw, who had lost his son along with a niece and a nephew in the explosion, found himself a focal point of people's anger. They blamed him for the switch from Union Gas to the residual pipeline. The school board had also overruled the building's original architect, who had proposed heating the school using a boiler and steam distribution system instead of the gas heaters the board ultimately went with. W.C. Shaw would eventually step down and leave the city after rumors of lynching began to swirl. Within two weeks of the disaster, the students of the London School were back on campus, completing the school year in portable buildings and the surviving gymnasium. Prom and graduation moved forward as planned. Hundreds of those less fortunate children were buried in Pleasant Hill Cemetery. One nine-year-old survivor, Carolyn Jones, spoke to the state legislature about her experience and they voted to add a sulfur compound to natural gas to serve as an alarm for leaks. But otherwise, New London seemed reluctant to speak of the matter. Children were hushed by their parents. Newspaper reporters were sent away with little information and students and teachers were left wondering if those missing when classes reconvened were dead or had been moved swiftly away by their frightened parents. A new school was built using bricks from the last and was completed just two years later. Despite appearing to have 
quickly moved on. Below the surface, anger swelled across New London. But with no one being held responsible, it was often unfairly aimed at survivors. In 2007, some of them spoke to Texas Monthly about their experiences stating, quote, my parents heard that some parents were saying that if they opened another school, they'd kill all the kids in there. A lot of the parents of friends who were killed found out that I'd survived and threatened to kill me. It was just the shock of it, I guess. Two mothers of children in our class never came out of their depression. They had emotional problems. I can understand why. A lot of people said, God took the best children and left the others. That hurt. But man caused it, not God. I guess people did what they thought was the best at the time. That's all we ever do." End quote. Forty years after the disaster, the first reunion for survivors was held. For many, it was the first time they had let out their emotions. Survivor Nadine Dorsey saying, quote, when I got the invitation for the 40th anniversary, I thought, OK, I'm ready. That's the first time I cried. Before that, I wouldn't think about it. I blocked the memory out of my life." End quote. The New London school explosion remains the deadliest school disaster in US history. A young Walter Cronkite had arrived on the scene at dusk on the evening of March the 18th, 1937, to report on his first national story for the United Press Association. He later said, I did nothing in my studies nor in my life to prepare me for a story of the magnitude of that New London tragedy, nor has any story since that awful day equaled it. The Bath School also suffered a tragic fate. However, this wasn't the result of a multitude of failings, rather the wrath of just one man. Located a few miles away from Lansing, the capital of Michigan, Bath Township today has a population of more than 11,500. But in 1927, it was nothing more than a small rural village that housed only a few hundred people. One of its main features was the three-story Bath Consolidated School, which had 314 students, despite having been built only five years earlier. Most of the students were the sons and daughters of farmers who lived in the region. They were bussed in every morning and after graduating from high school, either went to work on their family's lands or moved to the city in search of better opportunities. A simple tale retold across the states of those trying to live their own versions of the American dream. But all that would come to a tragic end on May the 18th, 1927. It was the last day of the school year with students paying more attention to the clock than what their teachers were saying as they eagerly awaited the start of their summer vacation. At 8.45 a.m. though, their morning lessons were suddenly interrupted by an explosion so powerful it was reportedly heard several miles away. Immediately after the explosion, the roof of the building's north wing collapsed, burying the students and teachers who were inside. Bystanders rushed forward to pull people out from the rubble, while others called for ropes so that the larger pieces of debris could be lifted. Descriptions of the bombing's aftermath are harrowing, to say the least. According to local author Monty J. Ellsworth, who wrote the Bath School Disaster, quote, there was a pile of children, about five or six, under the roof, and some of them had arms sticking out. Some had legs and some just their heads sticking out. They were unrecognizable because they were covered with dust, plaster, and blood. It is a miracle that many parents didn't lose their minds before the task of getting their children out of the ruins was completed." End quote. Meanwhile, author Arnie Bernstein, who wrote Bath Massacre, America's first school bombing, said, quote, Inside the school was just as awful as awful can be. There was one teacher whose head was wedged between two boards. She couldn't move just hoping to be rescued. There was a boy in front of her. They were almost face to face. The kid's eyes were open and she realized the kid was dead. Some people were identifying their children by their shoes. 
end quote. Shortly after the explosion, the authorities arrived at the site and began their investigations, hoping to figure out what had caused the blast. What they discovered was chilling. This was no accident. They found that hundreds of pounds of explosives had been planted and detonated. They found another 500 pounds of unexploded dynamite and pyrotol, an explosive reprocessed from military surplus, had been placed in the basement along with a huge container of gasoline, which they assumed was a backup plan in case the dynamite failed. Had these detonated, the explosion would have been even more deadly. While the investigation and rescue efforts were underway, a member of the Bath Consolidated School Board named Andrew Kehoe also arrived at the scene with a truck. Many assumed that he was there to help, but they couldn't have been more wrong. He saw Superintendent Emery E. Hoek and beckoned him over. Witnesses later reported that the pair then began to struggle with some sort of long gun before Kehoe did something unthinkable. Unbeknownst to anyone but himself, he had filled his car with dynamite and shrapnel. During the struggle, Kehoe managed to detonate these explosives, killing himself, Hike, and several others instantly. One of those lost in the second bombing was second grader Cleo Clayton, who had survived the first blast only to sadly perish as the car exploded. A total of 43 people lost their lives in the Bath School explosion. Of these, 38 were children, ages 8 to 14, who were buried alive when the roof collapsed on them. Also amongst those who died were two elementary teachers, Blanche Hart and Hazel Weatherby. In a recent interview, author Harold Schechter described the tragedy as, quote, a unique case in our history. I say it was the deadliest school massacre in our history, which it was, but it was also the only one, as far as I'm aware, that was committed with explosives. Kehoe really intended to murder every child in the community. I mean, if all the explosive he planted had actually detonated, he would have killed an entire generation of children in that community. It was a crime of such monstrous proportions that there really hasn't been anything quite like it." End quote. Andrew Kehoe and his wife, Nellie, were well known in the tight-knit Bath community. He was an electrician and had purchased surplus wartime explosives from the government to help local farmers remove unwanted tree stumps. He was also active on the school board, where he held the position of treasurer. Keyhole may have been active in the community. However, residents recalled him being hot-tempered and overly aggressive at times. For instance, he reportedly killed a neighbor's dog and was said to have beaten one of his horses to death. He had also gotten into a fierce argument with other members of the school board shortly before the explosion and was said to rant and rave at meetings. Most of these ravings were about taxes. Three townships had clubbed together to build the school, with residents agreeing to a tax to pay for it. Kehoe and his wife had no children, and so he vehemently fought against paying the tax. According to author Harold Schechter, quote, he was somebody who, in the spring of 1927, had descended into paranoia and basically had come to believe that his life had been destroyed financially and, in other ways, by his townspeople. They had voted to construct a very expensive, new, modern, consolidated school, and Kehoe, in the spring of 1927, very diabolically set out to take his revenge on the community by blowing up the school on the last day of the school year." End quote. The authorities already considered Kehoe as primary suspect, given that he had detonated a truck full of explosives on the site. However, an investigation on his farm confirmed their suspicions. At the back of the farm, they found the decaying corpse of his wife, Nellie, lying beside boxes that contained silverware, liberty bonds, and cash. She appeared to have been murdered only a day or so before the explosion. Along with these discoveries, they also found a sign reading, criminals are made, not born, attached to a fence surrounding the property. Kehoe's farm was virtually destroyed, 
with the evidence suggesting that he had firebombed it shortly before driving to the school and detonating the dynamite in his car. Besides his wife, all his horses had also been burned to death. Wires around their legs suggested that Keyhole had tied them up to ensure that they wouldn't escape the flames. Many believed that the bombing had been planned at least nine months before it actually happened, which was around the time of the town's election season. Kehoe had put up a fierce campaign to secure the position of township clerk, a position he had been occupying temporarily, but ultimately failed. Instead of accepting the fact he had lost the election, he took the voters' failure to elect him as a personal attack and instantly bore a grudge against his townsfolk. He set about getting his supposed revenge nearly immediately. He bought boxes of explosives and dynamite, something that wouldn't be seen as unusual for a farm owner to do as these would often be used to clear tree stumps. To obfuscate the amount he was buying and avoid suspicion, Kehoe would make his purchases from several different stores. It's also believed that he stole large amounts of dynamite from a nearby bridge construction site. It seems that this need for revenge had consumed him entirely. A neighbor states that he stopped working on his farm soon after the election and investigators discovered that he had destroyed crops, cut holes in wire fences and blew up tools and timber, gaining the nickname of the dynamite farmer amongst those living nearby. Because he was a proficient electrician and because they had no way of knowing the hatred he held for them, the school board hired Keyhole to conduct repairs on the building's lighting system in mid-1926. This gave him unfettered access and ample opportunity to conduct his awful plan. Ida Hall, a woman who lived nearby the school, noticed someone making regular visits to the building late at night, carrying large boxes inside on several occasions. She mentioned this to a relative, but nothing came of it. Through much of his preparations, his wife Nellie had been ill in hospital suffering from what was thought to be tuberculosis. She was released home on the 16th of May and murdered by Andrew sometime between then and when his horrific plan was put into action two days later. Given that the victims consisted mostly of children, the Bath school disaster unsurprisingly drew a ton of media attention. Reporters tried to make sense of the tragedy, with many alleging that Keyhole was mentally ill. For instance, a report published by the New York Times read, quote, Kehoe was notified last June that the mortgage on his farm would be foreclosed, and that may have been the circumstances that started the clockwork of anarchy and madness in his brain." End quote. Meanwhile, an article from the Boston Daily Globe stated that two head injuries Kehoe had reportedly sustained had disturbed his state of mind, leading him to bombing the school. The media's sentiments weren't shared by the local authorities, though. According to Arnie Bernstein, the author of Bath Massacre, America's First School Bombing, quote, at the conclusion of the inquest, it says he was of rational mind the whole time. It does take a rational mind to plan all that out. The reality is there's no why, end quote. For the local authorities, Kehoe wasn't insane simply because his crime was incredibly complicated. Not only did he properly wire hundreds of pounds of explosives, but he also created a backup plan in case the original one failed. Many in Bath believed that only a rational mind could have pulled this off. However, others believed that Kehoe was nothing more than a psychopath who wanted to massacre an entire generation of townspeople. In fact, he reportedly fits all the attributes of the psychopathy checklist, a set of criteria created by the Canadian criminal psychologist Robert Hare that includes items like a grandiose sense of self-worth, manipulativeness and cunningness. Andrew Kehoe was said to have exhibited all these. Thanks to the media's coverage of the disaster, volunteers flocked to Bath in the weeks following the bombing, offering to help out wherever they were needed. Even politicians lent a hand, with Senator James Cousins sending $75,000 to help rebuild the school. When the new building was finished, it was renamed 
the James Cousins Agriculture School in his honour. As tragic as the Bath School disaster was, it didn't hold the public's attention for long. Two days after it happened, the famed aviator Charles Lindbergh, who would of course go on to suffer his own tragedy, made the world's first ever non-stop transatlantic flight, which pushed the bombing out of the headlines. In 1975, the schoolhouse was torn down and replaced with a memorial park, which now houses the school's original cupola. While physical remnants of the disaster are no longer there, its ghosts continue to linger. Many of the town's residents grew up knowing that the name Keyhole meant pure evil. The survivors of the blast also remain haunted by the traumatic experience. Martha Horton, who was trapped on the second floor of the school when the explosion happened, recalled, quote, We were sort of raised out of our seats. The pastor came down and then we were panicked. In most cases, we remember our fallen soldiers. We should remember these children who were so innocent and had to die that way, end quote. A fellow schoolmate said, quote, We still look at ourselves as survivors. So you look after one another differently because you know that the absolute unthinkable can happen, even going to school, end quote. Texas is second only to Alaska on the list of largest states, and so it's probably no surprise that some of the worst disasters in the US have played out there. We return to the state for the story of the Texas City disaster. Ammonium nitrate is an industrial chemical commonly used in fertilizers and as an explosive for quarrying and mining. It has also been used in instant cold packs and at one point as part of an inflator for airbags. When uncontaminated and stored correctly, it is generally considered relatively safe. But it becomes hazardous if contaminated or mixed with fuel or indeed stored unsafely. When exposed to intense heat, large quantities of the substance can explode, so great care is taken to store and transport the chemical in smaller quantities and away from heat sources. In modern history, ammonium nitrate has been the chemical of choice for many terrorist and paramilitary organizations, such as those involved in the Irish Troubles to the Oklahoma City bomber. It was also cited as being used in the 2002 Bali nightclub bombings that killed more than 200, and many IEDs used in Afghanistan contained this highly reactive chemical. Even when not weaponized, ammonium nitrate has been responsible for thousands of deaths through disastrous accidents. As early as 1916, it was named the culprit in factory explosions across the United States and the United Kingdom. And as recently as 2020, an ammonium nitrate explosion in Beirut killed over 200, injured over 6,000, and left over 300,000 people without homes. The chemical was also the key component in the deadliest industrial accident in US history. The potential for a deep water port was first spotted by three duck hunters in 1891, who noticed that a location along Galveston Bay was positioned perfectly for use as a major shipping channel. The men, brothers from Duluth, Minnesota, named Benjamin, Henry and Jacob Myers, convinced other investors to put up the money for them to buy the 10,000 acres of frontage known locally as Shoal Point. They renamed their holding Texas City and by 1893 had established a Texas City Improvement Company, opened a post office and convinced about 250 folks from Minnesota and Michigan to relocate to the city on the bay. The Texas City Improvement Company dredged a 40-foot deep shipping channel and built a railroad line to connect the port with Galveston, Houston and San Antonio. So thriving was the port that by 1910, its depth and length had been greatly expanded with 239 ships using its facilities. The Texas City Refining Company had also built a refinery to produce wax and lubricating oil next to the port. 
Three more refineries followed shortly after, cementing Texas City as an essential harbor for deep water shipping of petroleum products to the Atlantic coast. The 1920s brought a series of ambitious expansions, including a sugar refinery, a fig processing plant, a gasoline cracking plant, and a grain elevator. By 1925, Texas City was flourishing with its population growing to nearly 4,000. By 1940, it was the fourth ranked Texas port, exceeded only by Houston, Beaumont, and Port Arthur. World War II caused another boom of expansion, with the head of the Defense Plant Corporation building a tin smelter and petrochemical plant in Texas City. Monsanto Chemical Company was contracted to run the facility, but the many years of prosperity that Texas City was enjoying would end abruptly on the morning of April 16, 1947. The Grand Camp was a 437-foot-long Liberty ship carrying ammonium nitrate, small arms ammunition, machinery, and bales of sisal twine. The Grand Camp had just arrived from Houston and was preparing to deliver its cargo to Europe. After loading, the Grand Camp waited in the harbor near the SS High Flyer, which also carried ammonium nitrate as part of its cargo and about 1,600 metric tons of sulfur. Docked about 600 feet apart, the two massive ships were a common sight in the Texas City port. Around 8 a.m., smoke was spotted in the cargo hold of the Grand Camp. Dockers attempted to douse the flames with a gallon jug of water and two fire extinguishers, but their efforts were in vain. The captain ordered that hoses not be used, fearing water would ruin the cargo. Instead, ammunition was removed from the ship while other crew members attempted to restrict oxygen to the hold in the hopes of extinguishing the fire. Unfortunately, due to ammonium nitrate chemical composition, it can burn without an external oxygen source. At approximately 9 a.m., flames were seen flickering from the hold along with a column of yellow-orange smoke, typical of nitrogen dioxide fumes. By now, a crowd had begun to gather to watch the developing situation. They would feel there were a safe distance from the flames as the Texas City Volunteer Fire Department arrived and began fighting the blaze. However, just moments later, the Grand Camp exploded. The blast was so powerful it was heard 150 miles away. Many people at the docks were killed instantly. The blast leveled nearly a thousand buildings nearby and produced a 15-foot wave that swept through the port. The explosion destroyed the Monsanto plant entirely, killing 145 workers, and flying shrapnel ignited refineries and chemical tanks on the waterfront. Two aeroplanes flying nearby were also blown out of the sky, and the ship's two-ton anchor was later found 1.6 miles away. The massive ship's nearly 6,000 tons of steel were blown through the air, some at supersonic speed. Ten miles away in Galveston, windows shattered, and people were knocked to their knees. The devastation was unfathomable. The entire port was in ruins and fires caused by the explosions raged. 27 of the 28 members of the Texas City Volunteer Fire Department who had been fighting the fire on board the ship now lay dead. The sole survivor escaping the same fate as he decided to stay home to complete work on his roof. Soon, locals began rescue efforts with the limited supplies they had at hand but they were quickly joined by an additional 4,000 Red Cross workers and volunteers. However, fires and the general scale of the devastation made it difficult to reach the explosions, ground zero, and worst still, the destruction wasn't over. The Grand Camp explosion had rocked its neighboring ship, the High Flyer, so violently its moorings snapped, sending it drifting across the harbor before coming to rest beside the Wilson B. Keene. Those who survived the Grand Camp blast evacuated. But later in the afternoon, two men boarded the High Flyer searching for injured crew. They noticed 
the cargo aboard was on fire and alerted someone on the harbour front. But in the mass confusion and panic, the message was ignored for hours until an official realised what a serious problem the secondary blaze could be. At 11pm, tugboats were dispatched to haul the high flyer away from the docks, but they were unable to shift her. The fire burned all night and the volunteers attempting to move the ship were evacuated. It's said that the fire was so fierce by this point that the ship's steel frame became glowing hot. At 1.10 p.m. the following afternoon, the high flyer exploded with even greater force than the Grand Camp flattening what was left of the port. Thankfully, the docks had been evacuated, so casualties from the second explosion were few, but chunks of glowing hot metal now rained down upon Texas City, igniting more fires. A propeller from the high flyer was found nearly a mile inland. When the dust settled, it became clear that the destruction these two explosions caused was massive. More than 500 homes were destroyed with hundreds more damaged, leaving some 2,000 people homeless. Over a thousand vehicles were damaged and over 300 freight cars were demolished. Along with the destruction of refineries and other businesses at the port, the total property damage was estimated at $100 million, roughly one and a quarter billion in today's money. There was also 500 million in oil products destroyed, close to six and a half billion dollars. In nearby Galveston, smoke from the burning oil and chemicals left the city coated in an oily residue. And Texas City itself was little more than a smoldering ruin. Even more devastating than the massive loss of property was the massive loss of lives. Morgues around the area were quickly overwhelmed and bodies were laid out in the local high school's gymnasium for identification. Local, state, and federal officials descended on Texas City, working to identify victims for more than two months after the disaster. In some cases, the FBI matched fingerprints from unidentified remains, but 63 victims were never identified, despite the monumental effort, and nearly 200 people were reported missing. The estimated death toll was at least 581 people, with more than 5,000 injured. The real total could be much higher, with some believing that the deaths of many travelers, seamen, and undocumented workers were not added to the final tally. The exact cause of the fire on the Grand Camp was never identified. There was no evidence left and no surviving crew members to ask. Some speculated that it was likely a carelessly discarded cigarette that started the fire, but there's no way to know. The explosion ushered in one of the first class action lawsuits against the United States government on behalf of 8,485 plaintiffs in Elizabeth Dalahite et al. versus United States under the recently enacted Federal Tort Claims Act, which allowed private citizens to sue the United States in a federal court. On April the 13th, 1950, the district court found the United States responsible for numerous negligent acts by 168 agencies and their representatives in the manufacture, packaging, and labeling of ammonium nitrate. There was also negligence found in the transport, storage, loading, fire prevention, and fire suppression but this decision was overturned by the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals two years later, and the Supreme Court affirmed that decision in 1953, noting that the district court had no jurisdiction under the federal statute to find the U.S. government liable for negligent planning decisions, which were properly delegated to various departments and agencies. The three dissenting justices argued that Congress has defined the tort liability of the government as analogous to that of a private person, noting that an individual would have certainly been held liable for such acts and as held to a higher standard of care than the government itself while carrying out inherently dangerous acts like the transportation and storage of explosives. 
The Delahite decision was appealed to Congress, which granted relief through legislation. By 1957, Congress had given 1,394 awards, totaling nearly $17 million. In Texas City, Monsanto and other plants committed to rebuilding, and the city recovered surprisingly well, earning it the nickname, the town that would not die. U.S. officials took note of the widespread destruction that had previously been thought only possible in the event of a nuclear explosion, and began developing its disaster preparedness plans. In 2005, the city suffered another explosion when a hydrocarbon vapor cloud at a BP oil refinery ignited, killing 15 workers and injuring 180 more. Hurricane Ike in 2008 devastated Galveston County, but Texas City was largely spared. Today, Texas City is still built on heavy industry and is a leading center of petrochemical refining. Ammonium nitrate is still used widely today, and despite stricter regulations regarding its storage and transport, it remains a dangerous chemical. The Texas City disaster remains the seventh largest accidental non-nuclear explosion in history, and the third largest caused by ammonium nitrate. The propeller and anchor from the High Flyer and Grand Camp, respectively, now stand as memorials to those lost on that tragic day. Though on a much smaller scale, the explosion at Webb's Bait Farm was no less devastating for those caught in its deadly path. Most historians agree that fireworks likely originated in Laoyang, China, around the second century BC. These early examples of the fireworks we now know were natural firecrackers crafted from bamboo stalks that would explode with a bang when tossed onto a fire. These little explosions were popular amongst Chinese who believed they could help in warding off evil spirits. Legend has it that sometime around 600 to 900 AD, a Chinese alchemist experimented with mixing potassium nitrate, sulfur, and charcoal to produce a black flaky powder that could be poured into hollow bamboo sticks to create a more satisfying explosion. This substance, the first known gunpowder, was later put into stiff paper tubes to achieve the same effect, thus creating the first modern Firework. Fireworks made their way to Europe in the 13th century and were widely used in religious festivals and other forms of public entertainment by the 15th century. The obsession with fireworks followed early US settlers across the Atlantic, where the use of them gained popularity with their appearance at the first Independence Day celebration. Founding father John Adams even said he hoped the 4th of July would continue to be celebrated through the centuries with pomp, parade, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other. In 1970, the US Department of Transportation established limits on pyrotechnic composition for consumer fireworks, and in 1976, the newly created US Consumer Product Safety Commission, or CPSC, took on regulating the construction and performance requirements for consumer fireworks. Those regulations include cautionary labeling, fuse burn time, explosive content, stability of devices, and proper performance. These nationally enforced regulations resulted in a decrease of firework-related injuries, and the quality of products improved drastically. The laws governing the sale of consumer fireworks are determined by the state and can vary even from county to county depending on local ordinances. It's not uncommon for Americans to cross state lines to purchase fireworks that are illegal in their home jurisdictions. These gaps in legislation have made producing and purchasing illegal fireworks a lucrative business for many small operations. But working with explosives is a dangerous occupation, made more so by facilities that lack proper oversight. Never 
Has this been made more explicit than in the case of the Benton fireworks disaster of 1983? On a rural country lane in Polk County, Tennessee, a worm farm called Webb's Bait Farm decided to earn a bit of extra cash by manufacturing illegal fireworks, specifically M80 and M100 fireworks, both of which are prohibited for manufacture, possession and sales without a proper license under federal laws. In 1982, farm owner Dan Lee Webb, along with relative David Parks and Howard Emmett Bramblett, began manufacturing these illegal explosives in an old metal dairy barn on the farm. Bramblett, who owned a fireworks store in nearby Benton, suggested the operation to offset Webb's financial problems. He taught Webb and Parks how to make the fireworks and connected the men with suppliers and distributors. Once in full swing, the operation was producing up to 130 cases of fireworks a week, each containing up to 1,440 individual explosives. Webb began employing friends and relatives to make the fireworks in late September of 1982, paying them $5 an hour in cash under the table. Bramblett arranged for the sale of the fireworks for $160 a case, with $20 for himself and the rest going to Webb and Parks. The operation was so successful that Bramblett soon had to bring on another man, John Franklin Miller of Ohio, to help handle the deliveries. Miller had his own history of illegal fireworks sales and was key in supplying materials and soliciting customers for the Webb's factory. The factory itself was a two-story, 40 by 70 foot barn that housed a chemical mixing room on the first floor and an assembly room on the second. One former employee said after they filled the firecracker tubes with the chemical stuff, I put liquid glass on one end of the tubes and then I put on the fuses. The employees at the plant mixed the flash powder by hand, which was then funneled into tubes. The result was known as quarter pounders because they packed the power of a quarter stick of dynamite. The gig was a success. Between December of 1982 and May of 1983, Webb's illegal operation produced and distributed over 1.5 million M-series fireworks across at least 12 states, netting a profit of $1.25 million. On the morning of May the 27th, 1983, the fireworks factory was in full swing with 11 workers mixing flash powder and assembling the products. At approximately 9.15, a cache of explosives, flash powder and other chemicals detonated, resulting in an explosion that could be felt and heard for 20 miles. The initial blast was followed by a series of explosions which rippled through the air for miles like gunshots. All 11 workers in the barn were killed instantly. Their bodies hurled as far away as 500 feet and left in pieces. Webb's cousin, Tommy, who was mowing the lawn nearby, was thrown more than 70 yards. Trees were leveled by a shockwave that extended for 100 yards in each direction. The force of the blast shattered windows on nearby properties and parts of bodies were tossed through the roofs of the house and carport at the farm. A white mushroom cloud towering 800 feet into the sky was seen by witnesses all around and 911 calls began pouring in within moments of the explosion. Police arrived on the scene within minutes and found the barn flattened. Webb's wife, Linda Sue, fled from the house before deputies arrived. Tommy Webb was rushed to the hospital in critical condition, with burns covering over 30% of his body. Beyond that, there was nothing to be done for the poor souls on site. Crews from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, ATF, and the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, TBI, were called in to investigate and forensic anthropologists worked to gather the body parts and identify the victims. 
The barn was destroyed so effectively, it was impossible to determine with absolute certainty what had caused the explosion. But the charred remains of a drill with a paint stirring attachment led to the largely accepted conclusion that the cause was likely a spark from the drill's motor hitting the mixture. But there were plenty of other safety hazards present and it's possible the blast was caused by an electrical wire, an appliance or even the scraping of boots against the floor. ATF agents concluded that approximately 300 pounds of explosive were detonated in the blast. They also found 172 boxes of unexploded fireworks worth about $20,000 and six 55 gallon steel drums full of chemical explosives. The 11 victims were friends or family of Webb who were experiencing unemployment or underemployment and took the jobs without being aware of the dangers involved or being trained in workplace safety. Dan Lee Webb was in Lansing, Illinois, delivering a shipment of over 80,000 M80s when the explosion took the lives of nearly everyone he cared about. He surrendered at the Polk County Jail two days later and was charged with 11 counts of involuntary manslaughter and illegally manufacturing and possessing explosives. Bramblett was arrested in Chatsworth, Georgia. It was revealed that he was connected to another illegal fireworks operation in Roseville, South Carolina, that resulted in an explosion killing two just days before the Benton disaster. 20 people from nine different states were indicted on federal charges related to the operation. Dan Lee Webb served 10 years in federal prison and was fined $10,000. Bramblett was also sentenced to 10 years for manufacturing illegal fireworks conspiracy and storing homemade illegal explosives. The Benton disaster was the largest and most profitable known illegal fireworks operation in US history and also the deadliest. It launched a two-year federal investigation that ended a multi-state bootleg explosives operation. The land where Webb's bait farm and the illegal operation once operated is now occupied by a rafting company. But locals have never forgotten the day Dan Lee Webb's quest to earn some extra money resulted in the tragic death of 11 workers. In our final entry, we explore the Duffy Street Rail Disaster, a rare case of disaster hitting the same location twice. Duffy Street lies in a quiet residential area of San Bernardino, California. Early mornings in this neighborhood are punctuated by the sounds of car doors slamming as commuters prepare for the morning traffic, the laughter of kids walking toward the bus stop and the rumble of trains traversing the nearby Cajon Pass. Duffy Street resident Early Davis heard all this as she stepped out to pick up her paper from the yard on the morning of Friday, May the 12th, 1989. But she heard something else too, a deep rumble that shook the very ground she stood on. Early Davis ran back to her house, covering her head and waiting for the earthquake. The 56-year-old Californian was frightened, but not surprised. The newspapers had been predicting the big run for weeks. But as she shouted, it's here, it's here, and turned to peer out her window, she didn't see the ground quake and split. Instead, she saw a train barrel directly into the home across the street. Minutes before Early Davis witnessed a train flatten Christopher Shaw's home, a crewman on board the Southern Pacific freight train radioed a mayday call. The train, comprised of six locomotives and 69 cars, was carrying a sand-like mineral known as Trona. In Mojave, the Clarks calculated the train's tonnage at 6,151. The Caron Pass was steep, but there had never been an issue on this route. The small crew of five men aboard was nearly at the end of the journey, ready to unload their cargo at the port of Los Angeles after departing from Mojave seven hours earlier. 
But as the train crested the apex of the grade and started down the south side of Caron Pass, it became apparent that there was a problem. At the head of the train, engineer Frank Holland was having trouble controlling the train's speed. He threw the train's air brakes into operation along with dynamic brakes of the lead locomotives in an effort to slow the now frighteningly fast progress of the machine. He asked the helper engine's engineer to do what he could do to help, but there was only one working dynamic brake on the engine. The helper engineer, Lawrence Hill, activated the emergency brake in a panic. The men aboard tried desperately to slow the beast, not knowing that the tonnage estimate for their load was off by nearly 2,000. Instead of slowing the train, applying the emergency brake disabled all the dynamic brakes, allowing it to continue to pick up speed, with the air brakes melting from the friction and heat as the juggernaut reached a terrifying speed of 110 miles per hour on the four degree curve just north of the Highland Avenue overpass. The maximum authorized speed on the overpass being 40 miles per hour. The freight train didn't stand a chance and it departed the tracks before plunging down a 30 foot embankment to Duffy Street. The runaway train slammed into seven homes before finally coming to a rest. There's a reason the expression hit by a freight train is used to describe utter devastation because no other expression correctly paints the destruction of Duffy Street. Trona ash hung in the air as emergency workers and rescue dogs combed the rubble for the missing. Two children, Jason Thompson, aged 10, and Tyson White, aged 7, who were in front of their houses at the time of the derailment, were found dead. Christopher Shaw, whose house Early Davis had seen flattened by the train, was, however, found alive. Miraculously, three of the five train crew also survived, though 35-year-old conductor Everett Crown and 43-year-old Alan Rees, brakeman on the third locomotive, wouldn't be so lucky. With the injured being taken to hospitals and the dead to the morgue, the surviving residents tried their best to pick up the pieces and push visions of the demonic train wreck from their memories. Those left homeless were moved to a hotel downtown. Early Davis watched two cranes move the wreckage from her front window, but somehow the nightmare wasn't over yet. Thirteen days after the train derailment, Duffy Street was finding its way to a new normal. The train wreckage had been removed under the watchful eye of Calnev pipeline officials. They were there because a high-pressure petroleum transit pipeline ran through the area where the disaster took place and ferried petroleum beneath the site en route to Las Vegas. They carefully placed stakes to mark the line and once the train was removed, they departed leaving crews to dispose of the rubble on their own. The track where the derailment happened was rebuilt and returned to service. By May 25th, excavators had removed the demolished houses and collected the piles of Trona. Around 8 a.m. that morning, the train trundled through the length of track where the derailment had occurred. Minutes later, Duffy Street erupted in a ball of fire that could be seen from City Hall. The Calnerf pipeline had burst near the derailment site, showering Duffy Street in a fountain of gasoline. The fuel found a source of ignition in the pilot light of a water heater, and the neighborhood disappeared beneath a towering reddish mushroom cloud. Emergency workers once again flooded Duffy Street, with firefighters managing to control the flames enough to warrant a brief celebratory cry, believing several houses to be safe from the worst of the fire. But just as more fire units arrived and hooked up their hoses, the water pressure dropped to a trickle. There was not sufficient capacity to battle a blaze of that size. Limited by the meager water supply, it took firefighters seven hours to douse the inferno. Plumes of flame could be seen from far away, reaching the heights of 300 feet. 
By the time the last flames were extinguished, 11 homes had burned down, over 20 cars had been destroyed, and two people had been fatally burned. In less than two weeks, Duffy Street had lost 18 homes and several residents. The NTSB concluded that cleanup crews had damaged the pipeline and found leftover debris near the area the line ruptured. They also found that CalNav failed to conduct an excavation of the pipeline through the length of the derailment site, nor a hydrostatic test, either of which would have immediately located the damaged pipe. At the point of the rupture, the pipe was buried a mere two and a half feet below the surface. Kalnev repaired the line following the blaze, encased it in concrete and buried it that required six feet deep. But the move did little to make Duffy Street residents feel safe. They pressed the city to block the reopening of the Kalnev line, but a superior court judge blocked the request. Dejected and frustrated, the neighbours on Duffy Street turned to attorney James Herman Davis, who promised lavish payouts and hosted the victims at a formal party at his Los Angeles home. Davis was just another disaster for Duffy Street, disappearing and filing for bankruptcy after collecting a reported two million settlement from Southern Pacific and Calnerve. Today, the space on Duffy Street where 18 homes were destroyed sits empty. Southern Pacific and Calnev purchased the homes that were destroyed. Eventually, the land was donated to the city. Many of the residents who survived the dual disaster of May 1989 have since relocated. Those who remain continue to live with a degree of fear. Trains carrying chemicals still barrel past their homes each day. Petroleum, bound for Nevada, still rushes under their feet. Thank you for watching. Right then, take care, and I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, well, I never.